You are live. I love it. I love it when Scott says, we are live. No, he says, you are live. Okay. (laughs) I'm live. (laughs) It should say, I'm alive. Yeah. Right? Praise God. So, hi, Bill Fairman, Wendy Sweet. Tell all your friends. Capital Management. Thank you for (laughs) joining us again. We were just on... 10 minutes ago. Uh-huh. Talking about all the great news going on, all Ble- the good things going on in the world. And I was there to Debbie Downer. That's day. right. His cup is half empty. Because that's my job. <laughs> I am I am the anchor. So we are Carolina Capital Management. We do short-term loans in the Southeast. And we also have a fund that people can invest in. And we're rolling out a long-term product here in the next week. Yes. So if rentals. you are a borrower, you go to carolinahardmoney.com. Click on the borrower tab. If you're an investor looking for passive returns, uh, click on the investor tab. Don't forget to subscribe, share, like, all all that good stuff. Mm -hmm. And if you have any questions, we have a live chat over there to the right. If your question is worthy, I'm just kidding. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, if it stinks, we're just going to go right over it. I didn't see it. Sorry, can't see that far. So. We, we have a wonderful guest today, uh, Tim Bratz. He's a fellow uh, CG, yeah, fellow collective genius, fellow dude. Collective genius guy. Yeah, of course, sorry. Our, our last collective <laughs> genius meeting was virtual, like all the other virtual And it was meetings. pretty good online. Yeah, no, they it, did a great it, it job. It was, but it's just not the same. Um, we don't get to spend extra money on lunch. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> but it's a lot more fun networking when when we can do it in person. In the room, in, in the same in room. Yeah. Tim, th- thank you so much for, for joining. Yeah, absolutely. I'm excited to be here. Bill, Wendy, I, I look up to you guys and appreciate all the value you guys always bring. So, uh, yeah, I wish we could do it in person sometime. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> it's all good. We'll make it We'll make it work. That's right. All right. So you're, you're from Cleveland, right? I am from Cleveland, but I have a house in Charleston. Oh, wow. Mean? Yeah, I I, uh, I have a house on Isle of Palms and I'm um, actually coming well, down that? there in, in middle of August and I'll be down there and put my daughter in school down there. So. Oh, wow. So I was going to yeah. say, if you need us to check it out for you, we'd be happy to go yeah. down there. Yeah. And- I got a guest house. Come visit anytime you want. Our, our youngest brother has, <clears throat> he has a place there. Hardscape business. Yeah. And so about half his business is in Charleston. So he's got, he keeps his boat there and he has a house there as well. Love it. So hopefully we can uh, meet down there and, um, when they allow us to get together and we could write it off as a business trip. That's right. <laughs> you, got, you got Caleb's down there. Um, uh, Ron Phillips is down there. Yeah. Right? Matthew Bell. Yeah. Or, Bell's down there. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's a Good group. It, it's a, it's a neat place. Yeah. And, yeah. and my favorite beer is from Holy city brewing company in yeah. North Charleston. Yeah. <laughs> so, all right. So my question, my first question. We have an and, and important is, question. Yes. Yeah. Poignant, important <laughs> question. So does Cleveland really rock? Uh, I'll tell you what, Cleveland got a bad rap when I was going through school, right? When I was in high school, late nineties, you know, the whole steel belt thing, all, all that fell apart. And um, it was pretty rough for a little bit there. Uh, but they came back with a vengeance. I mean, Cleveland's a really cool town. It's, it's got a ton of happening, hot spots, nightlife. Uh, food scene's amazing here. Uh, we're right on Lake Erie, so there's a ton of boating and a ton of cool stuff going on out there. And um, the sports teams were crushing it for a couple of years, obviously, since LeBron left. And then uh, yeah. um, a couple other things have happened. So they've, they've gotten hurt a little bit, but uh, we're, getting, we're getting some good attention. So it's, uh, it's a good town. And, I mean, from an investment standpoint, it's one of the best cities, actually, to invest in. Like the amount of rents per purchase price is uh, like that ratio is pretty, pretty like really strong. If you're looking to buy and hold and have rental income and, and cash awesome. flow. So, Are you doing single family uh, as well? Not anymore. No, okay. not anymore. They, uh, I used to, you know, do a lot on the turnkey space. So I would buy a single family house, fix it all up, put a good tenant in place. I had a management company built up one of the larger uh, residential management companies in Cleveland. Um, and then I would sell that property off to an investor who was just looking for turnkey, right? Cash flow, predictability. And, um, and that was a cool business. But then a couple of years ago, about, eh, about three years ago now, I was looking at where was my net worth growing? And it was about uh, 10% of my time was spent in apartments. And it was 90% of my net worth. And I was like, time to pivot. You know, we're going to spend all of our time in, in buying and holding apartment buildings. And that's what we've just been focused on for the past few years. So um, 
it's amazing what happens when uh, what you focus on expands and you kind of make that declaration to, to the universe and how it, how it responds. And so well, you know, what's really funny is you said this, and I think it's really important what you just said is you realize that 90% of what your income was really coming off of the 10% of the work that you were doing. Mm -hmm. Right. And how many people do we know that don't even look at a dashboard? They mm -hmm. don't, they, they think they know what's bringing in the money, but when you really put those numbers in front of you and you pay attention to that, that's your true map. Mm -hmm. uh, the one that you should follow. That's work, great that you did work that. Work smarter, not harder. Yeah. That, right. I think you got to work hard at the beginning until sure. you, you gain the intelligence and then all of a sudden you can kind of pivot and put the right people in the right seats and, uh, and then grow your business smart. So did you also go through um, EOS? Uh, not fully, but all the masterminds that I'm in, they all talk about EOS all the time. So I've read traction and uh, my COO is like obsessed with it. Uh, we never hired like one of those coaches, but we've, right. we, oh, it's pretty much how we run our business. It's not EOS. Yeah. Yeah. It changed, it changed our world when yeah. we oh, did it's it. Yeah. It's really, so, really good. So what got you into the apartment business? You were doing this single family thing. And, and so what got you into the apartment side? Yeah. So, um, I mean, I was going through college during the last market boom, right? Oh, three to 07. I was going through college, money motivated. Everybody says everybody makes money in real estate. So I got involved in real estate and uh, became a real estate agent initially. Then um, I got into wholesaling and then I got into flipping. And then all of a sudden I got into some buy and holds. And, um, and then I fell into this apartment building, an eight unit building in late 2012. And it was like, it was super cheap. They were asking 50 grand for an eight unit building in wow. Ohio. And like, it was a C-class area. And the market was kind of bottomed out at then. And um, it needed some work, but I went in, I was like, I can't mess this up. Right. I bought it for $30,000. I put another 50 into it. So I was in for about 10,000 a unit. Unbelievable. And it, and it netted me $27,000 a year. So it had 33% oh, wow. cap rate. Wow. Uh, again, I'm managing it though. And there was a lot of work and a lot of brain damage and, took up a lot of calories with dealing with that, that class of tenants. Um, but I ended up seeing the scale there of, Hey, instead of driving to eight single family houses, I can drive to one apartment building and manage it. It was just easier. I can go look at one roof instead of eight roofs. I could raise money on one deal versus eight deals. I can, um, uh, you know, manage and look at one foundation versus eight foundations. It was just easier and more scalable for me. So that really appealed to me in, in 2012, 2013, I decided to just focus on apartments. And um, built up portfolio, about 140 units by the time it was like, I don't know, 2015, 2016. And then that partnership, I had that exclusive partnership with a couple of guys and that we just kind of didn't see eye to eye on where we were going and who was bringing um, the value to the project, I guess you could say. And so we decided to end up liquidating everything huh. around 2015, 2016. So it was one of those, like, you press the reset button. I just worked my tail off for the past three, four years. And I got to start all over again. Uh, but it really just kind of took a lot of weight off my shoulders and allowed me to do some different stuff and work with other people that I wasn't able to work with before. Uh, but I kind of I had to liquidate that portfolio. And in order to just kind of keep the, the, the lights on and keep food on the table, I got back into single family, got into the turnkey space. So we we're flipping 80 to 100 houses a year, making some decent money there. And then I was I was passively uh, investing in or raising money for and sponsoring loans for and um, uh, on some multifamily stuff down in the Southeast for a good buddy of mine. And uh, again, a couple couple years after that, you know, by 2017, I had about 400 units in my portfolio and um, that produced more net worth than, you know, the transactional stuff on, on the flipping of the houses. So I decided to pivot my team and we just started, we only looked at apartment buildings. And the first deal that comes across our desk when I like shut down and burned the ships on the single family was, um, was an 11 unit apartment building actually right up the street here. We wholesaled it, made $87,000 on it. Wow. Right? The next deal is a 14 unit, um, uh, about a, two miles up the road. And we ended up flipping that, made $120,000 on that. And then all of a sudden we took down a 20 unit and kept it. And then we took down a 74 unit portfolio and kept it. And then we just kept on growing and growing and growing. And um, uh, in 2018, I had about six, 700 units. And this big portfolio came across my desk for another 730. And I ended up buying that in June of 2018. And that took wow. me to like 13, 1400 units. And then all of a sudden the snowball effect occurred. We got all sorts of deals because that was a really difficult portfolio to take down. A lot of buyers couldn't do it because sure. they didn't have the, uh, 
uh, the operations and the construction background that we have. And so we were able to take it down and all of a sudden we got an influx of deals that were uh, too distressed for a lot of small buyers to qualify for and also too distressed for the big hedge funds and REITs to want to get involved with, right? They just wanted to clean, buy it, let it cash flow. So we found this niche of ours was big deals that were distressed. And I took the exact same philosophy of buying and uh, flipping single family houses into multifamily. I'm, I'm not, you know, my great granddad didn't have a bunch of apartment buildings. I never went to an Ivy League school and majored in real estate or finance. Um, I, I, I don't have a background in commercial real estate. I have a background in residential. And my residential buying formula was I'm going to be all in for 65% of the after repair value. And I thought if I'm buying apartment buildings, that makes sense to do it the same way. Right. And so I started buying apartment buildings <clears> where <throat> I could buy them at a wholesale price. I could create appreciation through that value add process. And then, uh, and then instead of selling it, uh, I ended up turning around and refinancing it. So if I'm all in for 65 cents on the dollar, I could get a 70% loan at the new valuation and then just refinance out my short term money and then hold this property long term without having any of my own money in, in, in the deal anymore. And it allows me to then recycle my investor capital and, and uh, uh, those partners. So it allows us to get into more deals and offer more velocity um, on our money and our investors money into more and more projects because we can turn them over in 18 months on average. Awesome. Now you talk, you're talking about your investors money. So, just touch a little bit on, there's so many different ways to finance things. I think that's a lot of people's biggest problem when they're, when they're in this business or trying to get in this business, they think that money is hard to find. It's not, is it? it, it th there's a couple of things you got to be aware of. If you're going to go try to raise money, um, lenders are looking primarily at three things. One is what is the asset, right? Real estate's an easy asset, especially, you know, single family houses or multifamily property, uh, people can wrap their head about it around it, even if they're not in the real estate world. Like they understand apartments, right? They understand real estate. They know that wealth is built through real estate. Most entrepreneurs understand that. So the asset isn't very difficult to kind of sell somebody on. The second thing you got to look at is what is the return? And is the reward worth the risk to that investor, right? Um, if they're going to invest with you, you know, is, is their return on investment great enough for the downside risk of that? Uh, not only that, but it's what else do they have or could they invest in, right? And so you, know, you guys are in, in real estate, so you know that you can go and make 12, 15, 18% on your money all day. And so um, versus somebody who only puts money in the stock market and it's very volatile and it goes up and down, they, they're just trying to get a, a steady 3% return on their investment. So you know, something that I offer might be not a good enough return for you guys, but it might be like too good to be true for other people. Right. And so we try to, we try to play in the middle. Um, and uh, so, and understand that the other thing that I realize is, is from a return perspective is a lot of investors usually fall in one of two categories. There is either the, um, the, the debt type of loan where it's a very predictable return on investment. It's like an annuity it pays you every single month. And it's very predictable and people love that. And I, and I, and I, I love that too. Um, I think that's a, a really good way to be a passive lender into something. But then there's other people who want the equity piece, right? And they're like, hey, I'm okay. I don't need the cash flow right now. I'm really looking for more growth. But guess what? There's also downside risk to that element as well. Mm -hmm. uh, what, there's, what I don't find a lot of, and kind of where we created a little bit of a, uh, of a unique position, is kind of a hybrid between both of them. And so what we do is we pay a fixed return on investment to our investors and then uh, they get all their money back and then we keep them in the, in the deal and they have a little piece of equity forever. So now they can actually build some wealth, which is cool. And they have some depreciation and cash flow and future refi proceeds, future sales proceeds, which is great for them. But then they also earned a predictable return while their money was in play. And, um, and I see some people who like structure it that way on the single family side. Maybe they, um, Maybe they're not holding the asset long term, but uh, I, I find from a return perspective, investors are looking for like, what's a minimum worst case scenario. And I've seen single family guys that have, have structured it where, hey, I'm going to pay you 12% return on your investment or 15% of the profit, whichever is greater. And when you offer it in that way and you create a minimum uh, return for the investor with additional upside, potentially, uh, it's a lot easier to raise money in that capacity. 
So uh, number one is the asset, number two is the return, and then number three, which was, which I found is the most important in raising capital is uh, the credibility and the character of the borrower. Amen. Right? And so if here's what I try to convey. If crap hits the fan, everything falls apart, what your, what your investors are looking for is, and what they're asking themselves, whether they're asking you directly or at least asking themselves in their, in their head is, does this person have the fortitude to repay me my money? Mm. You know, if crap hits the fan, is Wendy going to go and work third shift at Taco Bell to make sure that I get my money back? And I've, I've uh, conveyed that to my investors, like, you will get your money back, right? I've had one deal, uh, one apartment building. I'm really bad at flipping houses. I've lost a, money, a bunch of money on houses, but not, none of my investors have ever lost money, right? <laughs> uh, but I had, I've only lost money on one apartment building ever, um, and it was my fault, right? Like I bought it from a buddy. He told me it was 80% occupied. It was 80% occupied, but physical occupancy and economic occupancy are two different things. Mm. So although, although it was 80% occupied, only 25% of tenants were actually paying rent. Oh, wow. So uh, the buddy's not as much of a buddy anymore. Um, <laughs> but, but I bought this deal. I thought I'd flip it, make a bunch of money on it in six months and pay my investor and uh, it was kind of like a joint venture type deal. He put up the money. He owned fifty percent. I owned fifty percent, and we just um, did it that way. But what happened was, I took it over. Had to evict a bunch of people. Had to renovate twenty five more units than we thought we'd have to do wow. only for a year and a half instead of six months. And all of a sudden, in order to get rid of this deal, I had I had to stroke a check, or the the, the partnership had to stroke a check for fifty thousand dollars. The dilemma there is, it really hurts your credibility if you ask your investor to take that that lump. Are they ever going to invest with you? Probably not. Right. Yeah, right. So what I ended up doing is I ended up writing the whole check. I took the loss. I gave him a hundred percent of his money back. He didn't make any return on it though, which is a downside. But what I ended up doing is I, I, I made it work because I gave him equity in another deal that I was buying at the same time without him having to put up any money. So it allowed for him to get the return on investment and maybe in a different way, right? It's not all upfront. It's an equity and deal. Sure. Um, but you make good on it, right? And if you do the right thing by your investors, you build up that reputation, you build up a lot of credibility and character um, for doing the right thing, even when things get tough. Uh, I think it makes it a lot easier, you know, that that word spreads and travels and it's, it makes it a lot easier to raise, raise private money. Well, people, everyone understands that there are risks in investing in anything. And while real estate has, I believe, the least amount of risk, uh, in, in the investing world, they understand that there is risk. And if you're doing your best to make sure they do not lose any of their uh, initial capital, mm -hmm. uh, that's better than most anybody else would do. And mm -hmm. The fact that you're uh, giving them equity in, in another property, that's, that's above and beyond. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> are you, uh, do you have a fund structure or are you just doing joint ventures? Yeah, on a deal by deal basis, we we every single one of our uh, deals is an SEC regulated investment. So we okay. we structure it, we file with the SEC. Um, so you're doing syndications on, on I'm each one. Yeah, yeah, on every single one, it's a deal by deal basis. I don't have like a general fund that people can just invest in and make a fixed return. Um, every That's a deal accounting nightmare. <laughs> it's it's an accounting nightmare, and it's very difficult because if you can't deploy the money. What I've seen is if you can't deploy the money, it's a balancing act. Money's right, coming right. in. You're supposed to be paying it a, a return on it. And if you can't, it, and I see, I've seen people who have invested in bad deals just because they had to get the money in play. Right. And I never want to be right. in that, that side of, sort of a position. So we only raise money when we need money. Uh, there might be a general fund structure that we put together eventually, but if the money's not deployed, it sits in like a money market account that makes two or 3%. And because we'd have 50 or $100 million in that account, right. um, we can get a higher return uh, from a money market than you could if you had $500,000 in you know, your local bank. So there's, there's some scale that we can offer and benefit to the investors there uh, where they're making a better return than they would sitting in their own account. And at the same time, it allows us to then only invest in really, really good deals and be very calculated in that regard. Right. So yeah, thinking. I, I just think it's too difficult in a general fund to, figure out values and depreciation on different assets. And it's that too. Yeah, for sure. It's a pain. It's very uh, complicated. So you got to look at it from a, like a silo deal by deal basis. Yeah. And then from a deal by deal, um, 
Yeah, we, so then we syndicate. Some of them are 506B, some of them are 506C, which means it's either accredited or open to everybody. Um, and then we raise money on that specific deal. And then whenever that deal refinances or sells, then we end up paying the investors their money back. And then we can roll it. But we always have deal flow, right? Like I do a little bit on the education side. So I have you know hundreds, maybe thousands of people that are sending me deals on a monthly basis. Right. And we, we, we're always able to kind of siphon through those and find the best deals and, um, and so, you know, we're closing on one to two apartment buildings every month. So we can always put, you know, their money back in play. What, so, what areas, I'm sorry, what, yeah. what areas are you investing in, in the country? What, what's hot to you and what's not hot? Southeast. I love the Southeast. Uh, I invest it. heavily in South Carolina and Georgia, South Carolina, mostly cause I, I have a house in Charleston, mostly along the coast in South Carolina. Mm -hmm. I would do some stuff. You guys are in, um, are you guys in, uh, Greenville or are you guys in Columbia? Charlotte area. We're in oh, Charlotte. you're right outside Charlotte. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I would, I love those markets. I just um, haven't come across a deal yet, I guess there. Um, right. I would definitely buy in those markets. I just love the Southeast because uh, it's more landlord friendly, first mm -hmm. of all. Secondly, you can do exterior improvements year round. Up here in the Midwest, you're stuck. You can only do it six, eight months a year on the right. outside doing the exterior improvements. And so your kind of hands are tied by weather. Uh, also, you got freezing pipes up here. You got snow. You got ice. You got salt that gets beat up on the uh, parking lots and all that kind of stuff. So, um, it, it the heating bills are more up here. So it just kind of balances out where it's more landlord friendly. Properties don't get beat up as much. Um, property taxes are typically lower in the southeast as well. I got a lot of stuff in South Carolina, Georgia. I have some stuff in North Carolina, Alabama. Uh, Louisiana and Florida as well. And then I have some stuff in the Midwest. I have things in Ohio just because of my team is right here. It's easy for us to find and manage and, and find opportunities. Um, and I have some stuff out in like Texas and Oklahoma. I mean, those are pretty good markets as well. If you're buying mm -hmm. decent deals uh, where I don't go, at least for multifamily is the Northeast and the, the like Pacific uh, West. Right. Um, just too tenant friendly. Uh, like they're trying to pass laws and uh, there was actually a law passed in Seattle that the city council said anybody who raises their hand for a rental property in Seattle has to be granted uh, that property regardless of their ability to pay for that rental property. See how <laughs> crazy that is? Like it, it legitimately crazy. passed city council and one <laughs> of the landlords ended up suing saying it was unconstitutional and it ended up being repealed. But some psychopath actually got that passed. <laughs> And other people voted for it. Like that to me is just out of control. And you're seeing the same thing up in New York um, and, and in the Northeast. Uh, now, though, I think those are good markets for other asset classes like office and retail and storage and warehouse and some of those types of things. I just wouldn't own multifamily in those markets just because right. it's too tenant friendly. Right. So, it's funny. We had that same conversation uh, in the earlier show uh, talking about those particular municipalities. And all it's doing is hurting the people that are trying to help because you're going to have fewer and fewer landlords there. And which means there's going to be fewer and fewer uh, properties available. Right. To rent. Right. Mm -hmm. So uh, they're nuts is what it is. They, they and, and you see a lot of that money coming into your guys's backyard. They're coming into Charlotte. They're coming into Charleston. They're coming into Atlanta right now in Tennessee, you know, Nashville. And uh, they're coming into all these Southeast markets and they're paying pretty close to New York prices now. And yeah. So, um, it's just, it's interesting. It's interesting how it's all, how all this stuff changes and moves around. So we'll see. Well, I, I was also going to uh, go back to your, your fund structure. So your, your syndication is paying for the acquisition or is it uh, paying for the, uh, the equity piece and then you can uh, get financing or is it just deal by deal? Yeah. So typically what our projects look like, I usually buy things that are, that are 100 units or bigger, uh, like 100 to 250 units is kind of like our sweet spot. Um, so if we go and buy, let's just say you got a 100 unit building uh, or 150 unit building, it doesn't even matter. But let's say the stabilized value of that building is going to be $10 million. It's very predictable to calculate the valuation on an apartment building or commercial property because it's all based on the income approach. Right. So you take the income minus the expenses, you get the net operating income, and then depending on the market that you're in, it'll be worth some sort of multiple of that, the cap rate, right? Um, based on the net operating income. So it's very predictable. I know what these properties are going to be worth before I ever even buy it. Uh, and it's very calculated. 
Um, so I can go in and say, hey, this property is going to be worth 10 million. I have to be at six and a half million dollars, let's say 65% of that stabilized value. Now I back out the construction costs, renovation costs, let's say that's a million dollars. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm buying it for five and a half or maybe five million dollars. Uh, the, 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 uh, how much I'm buying it for and renovating for and holding costs, that's irrelevant. Let's say my total cost basis is six and a half million dollars. I'll typically go get a bridge loan for about 80% of that, 75, 80%. So let's say I'm going to get a bridge loan from, I don't know, like any of these bridge lenders, right? Or it's some sort of debt fund. And they give me uh, 75, 80% of that money. So it's about, if I'm all in for six and a half million, let's say they give me $5 million of it. Then I go and raise one and a half million dollars from my equity investors. Mm -hmm. so they come in, <clears throat> and that, that could be one person stroking a check for one and a half million. That could be ten people stroking a check for one hundred fifty grand. That could be uh, any any variation in between. Sure. So I bring them in. We syndicate it. It's a it's an SEC filing, a Reg D filing um, with the government. They sign documentation. They're coming in as an equity investor. Um, now, because I'm creating the value and it's very predictable how quickly I can turn these projects around, my, my cost of capital is very predictable as well, what my holding costs are going to be, because I know I can turn this around in 12 months and then refinance it within 18 months, let's say. So if I'm going to borrow $150,000, or I'm sorry, $1.5 million, and I'm paying my investors 10% on it, let's say it's 150 grand a year, and let's say the property cash flows, I don't have to worry about it, I can pay for that 10% preferred return out of the cash flow. If for any reason the property doesn't cash flow, then I just create an interest reserve, kind of like what a traditional bank would do if, if you're having a new construction development or uh, you have a distressed asset that needs an interest reserve. So I'm baking that into the cost, my all-in cost basis of six and a half million dollars. Gotcha. Um, so those equity investors, they're bringing the money essentially for the down payment and maybe a little bit of operating capital for us. Um, and potentially an interest reserve even as well. And then what I do is I pay, I understand that investors want a predictable rate of return. So we pay uh, quarterly distributions, 10% annualized return on their investment for a year, year and a half while their money's in play. And then once the property stabilizes and cash flowing, then that money comes out of cash flows. Um, and what happens is then 18 months later, I can turn around and refinance the deal at 7% 70% LTV. So a $10 million valuation, I get a seven, uh, I'm sorry, a $7 million loan. And with that $7 million, it pays off the bridge loan of 5 million. Mm -hmm. It pays back my investors of 1.5 million. And then there's also $500,000 of non-taxable refi proceeds that then gets right. called up amongst me, any partners and our equity investors. And then all the chips are off the table. It's only house money in play. It's a non-recourse loan typically a long-term loan, long-term amortization schedule, 10 to 15 year um, term balloon on, the, on it and um, fixed interest rate, right? And so then we just let it cash flow and we let the tenants uh, pay down our principal balance every single month and, and uh, the property appreciates over time and we can recycle our investors capital and do another deal, another deal, another deal. And that's, that's how we structure it. Wow, Tim, you did a great job of explaining the details <laughs> in that. It, that's really hard to do, but he didn't miss a lick on nope. it, did he? That was and, awesome. And, and the, as the investor, you're getting a 10% return. At the same time, because they're an equity investor, they get depreciation passed through mm -hmm. to them as well. Because especially in the very beginning, uh, the values aren't there. It's not returning as much money as it could. So the depreciation would be much higher than it would uh, later on. Mm -hmm. Right. And without getting too much into the weeds, we like, here's how we, we pay our investors four ways. One is the fixed preferred return. Um, and then they get all their money back. And then the other three ways come from their equity. So we typically give up about 25% equity in perpetuity in the deal to our investors. So they'll get about 25% ownership forever as long as we own this. And that means they'll get 25% of the depreciation. They get 25% of the cash flows. They get 25% of the refi proceeds and they get 25% of any future sales proceeds. So um, it's very beneficial. And the way that we pay the PREF payment because they're also an equity investor is tax advantage. So what we do is we don't, they're not, they're not taxed this year at their earned income tax bracket like they would if they got a dividend from the stock market, right? Mm -hmm. um, what, what we do is, is it looks like a return of principal 
on their tax on their K one. So if they invested a hundred grand and we paid them ten grand a year, it looks like their balance is ninety thousand dollars. So that way, it's not taxable this year, and they're still owed a hundred thousand dollars when we refinance. It's just it's reclassified and it's classified into a long term capital gain that's paid when the property sells instead right. of this year at their earned income tax bracket. So awesome. it totally reclassifies their return on investment and uh, not only defers it, but reclassifies it into a lower tax bracket, which makes it heavily tax advantage as well. So, I mean, you think about it like real estate's the, 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 since the beginning of, I don't know, humanity, real estate's been uh, what wealth has been measured by. And right. when you got all the wealthy people, they typically have a lot of influence in the laws, including the tax laws. Sure. So there's a lot of tax law benefits and advantages for being a real estate investor and an investor. That, that's uh, for sure. We tell people all the time, it's the, the best way to build wealth is by owning the property, having ownership in a property. Fix and flip is eat money, you know, mm -hmm. it, it's income, but it goes away quickly. Mm -hmm. But building wealth is in, in owning the property. 100%. You're, you're so right. Well, there's another way. <laughs> Lending the money. Yeah. Where you're still getting cash flow, but you don't have the headaches of ownership or the responsibility. That, that's where you want to be. Right. Like, go to the biggest cities, go to Charlotte. What's, who's got the biggest buildings in Charlotte? Bank of America, you know, insurance companies and right. banks. It's all the big uh, New York city. You know, you got MetLife, you got all these different big, massive buildings. There are all in the finance industry. So if you can be the bank, that's what you want to be because right. I can promise you if I knew 15 years ago, what I know now about operations and how many times I'd be punched in the stomach, and kicked <laughs> in the teeth, I probably wouldn't have gotten involved in real estate because operations is not easy. It is very, very difficult. And you got to go take a lot of lumps in order to really uh, have your systems and processes dialed in. So if you can just get involved and get a predictable return along with some equity upside in these deals um, and just be the bank and be passive. like Yeah. Well said. And by the way, who well takes said. all the risk? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's the not the bank. <laughs> yeah. The, the bank's in it for a lot less than uh, the owner. Yeah. Uh, now the only downside is you, you don't get that depreciation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's okay. But, but in your hybrid, you can. So that's a, that's a, yeah. that's a great way to look at it. So, so let me ask you this question. You know, we, we've all been going through the virus, how, you know, being in the apartment world, how did, how did that affect your income and your rents? Um, and, and it's not over. I mean, they're saying that even in June, uh, they had more people actually not pay in June than, than any month since yeah, the virus a, hit. A third of all people missed their either mortgage or rent payment. It doesn't mean it was, they didn't it miss was it late. altogether. It, it was, was late. It was not paid on time. So, so how did this affect you? Yeah. So I think it's, that's like a, a million dollar question, billion dollar question. Right. And so here's like when all this stuff hits the fan, some people recoil and they kind of wait to see how things play out. Right. When everything was happening, I was like, we need to respond to this very intense situation with equal or greater intensity. And we need to hit this in the face before it hits us in the face. Right. And so we got very aggressive in communicating with everybody, both on our team, our vendors, our tenants, mm. every, and our lenders about what we had and our passive investors about what we were going to do and what our game plan was moving forward. So um, in March, at the end of March, the week before, you know, some people are like, I don't want the tenants to know that there's a moratorium on evictions. Guess what? They're going to eventually find out, right? So it's better to hear it from you than to hear it from their buddy who's like, guess what? We're not paying rent. Nobody's paying rent. So we reached out to everybody who said, hey, there's a moratorium on evictions. We're not going to evict anybody. That being said, that doesn't mean that you don't have to pay your rent. Rent is still due. Here's why. Because if you don't pay rent, we can't manage and operate the building, right? How do you think we pay for trash. How do you think we pay for extermination? How do you think we pay for the grass being cut? How do you think we pay for, like, you don't want rodents and bugs and all this stuff. How do you, like, what if the lights don't work, right? What if we can't heat the property? What if we can't pay for security and pay for somebody to pick up the phone call if you need maintenance done? Like, all that money goes to that. It doesn't go right. to some yacht that, 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 or jet that you think the landlord's going to be right. on. <laughs> but we have bills to pay and we pay for the property <clears> by, <throat> you know, passing up passing through the rents. And so we explained that. Uh, so we said, Hey, 
Rent is still due. It is still due on the first. It is still late with a fee after the fifth. And we will still be posting notices on whatever it was, like the 15th. And when evictions do open up, we will pursue evictions, right? That being said, if you are facing a hardship because of what's happening with COVID-19, we want to work with you. But I'm not going to chase you down, right? That's not my job. You're an adult. We're adults. I need you to reach out to us and let us know that you're facing hardship. And we will work out of a... a some sort of plan with you on a case-by-case -case basis. Now, if you did face this hardship, by the way, here's how, to, how, here's how to apply for unemployment. Here's some local church groups that are supporting people. Here's the local uh, um, subsidy organizations that are supporting people who need food assistance, rent assistance, uh, any sort of other income assistance. And we gave them all sorts of resources on the front end and what happened from that is we actually collected more rent in April than we did in March. Wow. We actually collected more rent in May than we did in April. Wow. Now the whole stimulus thing, right, also hit. So you can say, hey, maybe that was part of it. Um, but we we are ahead in we were also ahead in June. And I can say also this that uh, some of that was lease up, right? Like I buy a lot of value add stuff, and some of that income did come from apartments coming online leasing new apartments, new rents coming in, but we've been ahead on all of our rents month over month. Um, I actually haven't checked July yet, so I don't know where we are with July. Um, but every month since COVID hit, we've collected more rent than the previous month. That's um, awesome. We have about two or 3% of our tenants that are on workout plans. Um, and I have some stuff in like Albany, Georgia, which was like the, the, that's like where a lot of the whole COVID-19 thing hit. That was like the epicenter of it in the Southeast for a little bit there. And, um, and we, we, we did take some lumps in Albany, Georgia, but the rest of my portfolio is actually ahead of where we were everywhere else. We were pretty much steady in Albany, Georgia. We, we dipped a little bit. People paid late, but they ended up paying. Um, and uh, that's kind of, that's kind of how things played out there, but everywhere else we were actually ahead of it. I think because we were so proactive and so right. Intense in response right. to that's why that's awesome you, that's why you don't own one rental property you own 20 mm -hmm. and that's why you don't invest in one town you invest in 20. yeah <laughs> um speaking of that you're kind of spread out um and we're getting kind of close to the the time here but uh what about management do you is your management local and then you're using some feet on the ground uh, a little bit uh, you have a lot of automation involved tell me a little bit about the how you manage these properties yeah absolutely great question i think the beauty in t today's day and age is a lot of the softwares and things can be done remotely you know it's especially with covid 19 it's kind of forced people to be more uh open to technology and doing things a little bit differently so uh my team here in cleveland can asset manage anything around the country. Um, depending on physical property management, any unit that we have, any building that we have, it's typically 80 or 100 units or bigger, we have on-site personnel. So we have on-site leasing agents, on-site property manager, on-site maintenance staff. So they can utilize, like we have people right there that we can have in-house management and we can take care of that remotely. We can still pay bills from anywhere in the country, right? Like we can take maintenance calls from anywhere in the country. You can deploy work orders from anywhere in the country. You can, right, uh, right. like the way that we collect rents, we use something called Appfolio, which is a management software. Mm -hmm. And we require everybody to pay rent online and it registers real time. If they don't pay rent online, then they can take like a QR code that they can print out and go to any ACE check cashing, uh, 7-Eleven or CVS in the country, go up to the front desk or the front, uh, um, uh, or, what you call it? Yeah, the cashier's desk the register and uh, they can have it scanned and then give them cash right there and it uploads directly into our software wow. in real time. So you could do all those kinds of things. And uh, even leasing, like we're not really doing, uh, like we use something called um, Rently, R-E-N-T-L-Y. We just put a lockbox on one of the units and we furnish one unit. And it's pretty indicative of what all the units look like in that building, right? We renovate every unit to be the same. So we leave one unit open for, for showings and um, they go in and it's, it's kind of done, um, uh, off of like kind of what you see with, uh, um, the hotels and stuff, you know, you, Hey, you're going to give a credit card just for incidentals. It's really in case you screw up the unit, right? So <laughs> we have them, um, they have to take a picture of their license. They have to take a picture of their credit card and then it, it texts them on their phone, uh, from this lockbox. It texts them uh, what the code is. They type in the, lock, the lockbox code. They open it up. They can access the unit. They have to self-report any damage in the unit. 
and take a picture of it. Or, you know, if somebody finds it then thereafter, they're going to be billed for that damage to the unit. So it just them knowing that the credit card's on file, they make sure that they don't steal anything or break anything, but it allows us to show units without having to have a leasing agent there and rent yeah. one out 30, 40 bucks a month versus us having to have, you know, pay a 50% of first month rent to our leasing agents. So right. it allows more automations and nobody has to be there, right? So um, we've done a lot of stuff like that. We have a lot of in-house management, but then we also use third-party management in, in some markets. It just kind of depends on the market, depending on the property. Uh, but then we also we always have somebody who's local boots on the ground, kind of like an accountability partner that can go and put their eyes on the project on the property once a week or every other week. Nice. Wow, that's awesome. Uh, Tim, you, you've been an awesome guest. I want to talk about his coaching for a minute. Well, that's what I was okay, say. sorry. <laughs> I, I know you have coaching and I know you're you're looking for investors. What are, what are the, tell us real quick about your coaching. Cause I don't want to keep you too long. I know you got something else going on it too. Uh, and then uh, give us the best ways to people get in touch with you. Yeah. Well, Hey, first of all, I appreciate you guys having me here and I appreciate your abundant mindset, right? Like we're in real estate. We're always looking for deals. We're always looking for money. All of us are. And I think right. supporting each other, um, it shows that you have an abundance mindset because uh, you know, you got people like me on who's, who's an active operator and I'm bringing on yeah. money. You guys are bringing on money. It just kind of depends on what people are looking for. Um, and, uh, you guys on mine and I'm sure you guys are going to get private money and investors for mine. So it just shows that like you have an abundance mindset and that there's no limitation to how much capital is out there right. you know, put into good deals with good operators. So one, I want to appreciate and, and thank you guys for that. Thank um, you. And uh, yeah, you know, I do some coaching. I'm not one of these these gurus. I'm actually an operator. 95% of my income and my net worth comes from doing deals. Uh, but I figured out a way to um, educate people and teach them about how to find off market deals and teach them about um, how to raise capital. And what's happened is it's created more collaboration than over competition. Um, and so. I have other people who are bird dogging deals and sending them to me and we're looking at amazing deals all the time. And then there's other people who come out to my coach and they're like, you know what? It's a little bit too much work. I'm going to let you do that. And let you <laughs> kind of passively invest or raise some money or uh, give you some of my capital to go and, and deploy in deals. So that's really why I do the education. It creates deal flow and money flow and, um, uh, a lot of cool collaborative type partnerships as well. So, uh, yeah, that's, it's called, um, well, we're kind of shifting it around, but if you want to go to legacywealthholdings.com slash coaching, you can learn a little bit more about it there. Uh, you can also inquire on uh, if you got a deal that you want to sell us, buy from us, uh, joint venture with us. We're always joint venturing, joint venturing with great operators and great people. And sometimes we bring money uh, and sometimes we're raising money, right? Like this is, it's real estate. You're either deal heavy or you're money heavy and very right. rarely both at the same time, right? Like, <laughs> <laughs> We're always trying to do one or the other and try to balance, keep it balanced out. And so it just kind of depends on timing on, on where we are. But yeah, I appreciate that. We, um, we teach a lot of people how to scale from residential into apartments and really start building wealth, uh, the real wealth, right? Like the stuff that we we all think about and the, the thing that, that has the allure of why we get involved in real estate in the first place, that residual income, that passive income, that mailbox money. Right. And, um, but then we all get stuck in this transactional trap, right? And so this is the, the stuff that we... We really want, you know, so yeah, it's good. So I, I did uh, have the pleasure of listening to you and Mike Zlotnick uh, talking on your, one of your podcasts and mm -hmm. you know, he's wow. He's a smart guy. He's a great friend. It, it helps that him. he has a, a Russian accent because it makes him sound even smarter. Right? <laughs> <laughs> or, or more intimidating. One of the two. Yeah. <laughs> You're going to believe what he says. <laughs> Tim, thanks again for, for being on our show. Good Absolutely. stuff. Thanks Good for stuff. having me and, and appreciate you guys. Appreciate all the value you guys always bring and uh, excited to see you at the next mastermind. Thank you. Excellent. We are too. Thank so, you. So uh, folks, thanks for joining us again. Our website is carolinahardmoney.com. If you're a borrower, hit the borrower tab. If you're an investor, click on the investor tab. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe. And we will see you guys next week. Same time, same channel. Yep. Toodles. <laughs> Take care. <laughs>